Hello, it's Richard from Pond Guru Landscaping and in this series of videos I'm going to show how we're going to build this large wildlife pond at a school in Gosforth, North East England. Um, it's been quite expertly dug out by Deb Matt over the weekend and considering how rocky and horrible the ground is they've done a really good job. So all I'm going to do today is prepare the hole to take the liner. Since the hole is full of things like this, a lot of broken bricks, rocks, concrete, all sorts of rubbish, the larger lumps I'm just chucking straight out. The smaller ones, smaller ones, I'm actually just raking into position with a rough brush. Obviously if you had nice soil when you dug your hole, all you would do is get in with a spade and shape with a spade. But in this situation, which is very very rough, I'm just having to roughly shape the sides with a brush, possibly a rake, also a spade if I do hit a bit of soil if I'm lucky enough, and then I'm going to put a layer of sand down. That's basically it. I've removed all the big stones. Um, all the loose sharp objects have been taken out as well or compacted into new shelves. And the shelves have been cut more or less square. It's not perfect, but the ground isn't perfect either. It's horrendous ground to work with. Um, I've added a new shelf just below me here, which angles slightly back because this end close to me is going to be cobbled, a little bit like a beach, so that will help to retain the cobbles. The pond's just about prepared for the liner now, so all I need is liner, underlay and some soft sand. The sand will actually be used to help level some of the shelves, fill in some of the holes, and also cushion the liner. Let's take a minute here to explain why there's so many shelves in this pond. This shelf here is actually going to be used to build on. I'm going to build a dry stone wall on the inside once I get the liner in of course and the dry stone wall will come up to roughly that level. And then on top of that there'll be a big sandstone slab. So this has only been cut out to about two inches deep just to support the sandstone slab which will be cemented to the ground and to the dry stone wall. You'll see that in future videos. That just about wraps up preparing the hole. So in the next video I'll show you how I put the liner in and also what I do with the sand and underlay. Hello, welcome to part two of the pond build at Gosforth School. Today we're going to be putting the liner in, um, so we're in the process of chucking a bit of soft sand in. Because there's a lot of gravel and rocks and so on still in the hole, 
The sand will cover over all of them and set us up quite nicely for adding the underlay. We've got the sand in now. It's taken about three quarters of a ton so far. So what we're gonna do now is go around the sides with a rake and brush and flatten it out. Now we've got the sand pretty well spread out, we're going to put the underlay in. As we're putting the underlay down, we're overlapping it by anywhere between six inches and a foot, depending on how it goes down. And we're gonna use this, which is basically just a small blow torch to seal the underlay together, i.e. to fix this piece to this piece. What that does, it fastens everything down really nice, allows us to drag the liner over the top of it without disturbing anything. Also, prevents the, light, the underlay from blowing away because it is quite a windy day today. Also, if we get areas like this that require us to fold the underlay, we can use the heat gun to fasten it down nice and tight so that the liner doesn't have to go over a big ripple of underlay. The reason using the heat gun works on this particular type of underlay is because it's made of polyester. It's 300 grams per square meter polyester underlay. Polyester being plastic, when it's subjected to heat, it melts. So by passing a bit of heat onto here, it creates little bubbles of molten plastic. When you press that down on top, they fuse together and stick. That's the underlay in, all sealed down and um, secured with stones all the way around the sides on the outside of the pond, just in case the wind gets up and blows the whole lot away. Um, so now we're ready for the liner.
that's it we've loosely draped the liner in so we're going to put a little bit of water in just to settle the liner into the bottom of the pond and then we're going to pull the sides in gradually just to accommodate the rising water what we don't want is the sides of the pond all fixed down and then fill it up and then the liner stretched and be under pressure it really wants to be draped in pretty loosely and then filled up the liner we're using is a millimeter thick Firestone rubber with a 40 plus year guarantee so it's very thick good quality rubber now we've got the pond filling with water the water will help to pull the liner into all the nooks and crannies um, we're going to help it along its way because as it's getting pulled in we're going to go around and gradually pull the liner in from the sides and allow the water to fill in all the shelves with the pond being in a regular shape there's always going to be some folds so we'll try to predict where the folds are going to be by settling the liner in, securing it with stones just loosely and also forcing the liner into folds at certain points and then weighing that down with loose stones. When the water comes up, the pressure of water should press down on those folds and keep them flat after we've removed the loose stone. So that's it, the liner's in. Um, it's in the process of being filled up. We've pulled the liner so it's draped loosely into all the shelves and hopefully when the water comes up the liner will be pressed in and it'll go in very nicely. Because this is going to take a few hours to fill up, we're going to go to the quarry and get some stone. I'm pretty confident that the water is going to secure the liner well so that allows us to do that instead of standing here and watching it for the next two hours. So we'll catch up with it when we come back. That's it, we're back from the quarry. We've unloaded all the stone around the edges in various heaps. Um, the pond's just about full enough. So tomorrow we're gonna build around the shelf all the way around the pond with the dry stone wall. You'll catch that in part three. Thanks for watching. Welcome to part three of the pond build at Gosford School. Today I'm going to be installing a very short dry stone wall around the shelf under here. It'll be roughly to the height of the next shelf because on the next shelf that's where we're going to be putting the big slabs. I've got a really good range of stones which were selected from the quarry over the last few days and really all I'm looking for is a stone with a, just one good face and two flat surfaces. As long as it's got a flat surface here and here and a good face, very easy to build a wall with. You can just pick similar height stones and then overlap them with stones on top. If the stones aren't quite level, they'll always be pinned from behind so that when you look at the face of the wall, you can't see any little stones sticking out.
although I want the wall to look nice, I don't want it made so perfect that things like frogs and newts can't actually get through the wall behind it and into this cavity here, which will be a great little habitat for them. So I am leaving the odd little gap between the stones, pretty much in the, in the bottom layer of stones, so that things can get in and hide. The area around this side of the pond is going to have like a, a beachy sort of effect. So I'm finishing the wall here, adding a little bit more here and continuing on there just so you have like a, a two-part beach. It would look a bit boring if there was only one long strip of beach so I'm just going to try and break it up a bit. And then I'm going to put stones on the big shelf inside of here just to retain, to, like, to help to retain the cobbles when we tip them in. Because I've got loads of stone left, certain places around the pond, I'm going to make little refuges for amphibians. Basically just building a very, very rough dry stone wall up, but allowing big pockets, firstly for planting and also for animals to get in and out of these little caves. By doing that, gives me little entrance holes here, places to plant, and also a solid base to stand on should I need to get in and out of the pond at a later date. Now that I've got the wall of roughly the right height all the way around, still got plenty of stone left, so I'm going to break some of it up and use it as packing in the gaps. Obviously, I don't want to block all the gaps up, but the likes of here, animals can still get in here, but by sticking a stone in there, it'll help to stiffen the wall up.
Okay, that's the wall around the outside just about finished. Well, actually it is finished, apart from the capping. Um, I've smashed up bits of stone, put them loosely in the back there, making sure that there's plenty of space for newts and frogs and so on to get in. It's also going to be an excellent habitat for invertebrates, such as freshwater shrimp, freshwater lice, not to be confused with fish lice, uh, mosquito larvae, and all manner of invertebrates which will help to keep the water clear by eating away organic waste in the water. This is the top end. I don't know whether you can see there, there's one, two, three big stones on the shelf. They're going to actually support the uprights for the dipping platform, which is going to go on this end. So on this end here, there's going to be a dipping platform so the kids can get in and rive on in the deeper water. There's one, two, three refuges made with the excess stone. They'll be planted up. So it's starting to look fairly neat now. This top end here is going to be the beach. And by putting stones on the deep shelf, that'll help to retain all the cobbles that are going to go on here. So tomorrow, in part four, I'll be putting some of the edging stones on, cementing those on, and also creating the beach. I appreciate the fact that this sort of design probably isn't most people's idea of what a wildlife pond should be, but by providing all of this habitat for wildlife, it's actually going to create a really sustainable wildlife pond. Most people's idea of a wildlife pond would just be a shallow scrape in the ground, lined, filled with water, lined with soil and planted up with the appropriate aquatic plants. There's not actually much habitat there, so by building it this way, it should provide masses of habitat. Thanks for watching, I'll see you in part 4, where we'll be putting the edge and stone on and making the beach. Welcome to part 4 of our wildlife pond build. In this episode, we're going to be putting a lot of the edging on around the side of the pond and also creating the beachy area, which basically just involves tipping cobbles into here. So what we're doing now is filling this up with cobbles and also taking the big flat stones that we collected from the quarry and just laying them loosely where we think the probably is going to go. Once we get those as far around as we can, we'll then start cementing them on. Now that we've got most of the edging stones roughly laid in, we're going to start laying them on a fairly stiff bed of mortar, which is just sand and cement. Um, generally mix it five or six sand to one cement.
whilst putting these in, we're really treating each one as a, a separate entity, leaving a, leaving a nice deep gap behind here. We're going to fill that with soil and plant up with rushes and spreading plants to really soften the edges. What we're doing here is allowing a little bit of spare cement, putting a cobble of various size in, just to create a little bit more interest where the stones join. That leaves us a little pocket here, and here, and which we're going to fill with soil and plant. That's the sides done now, we've got both sides done, all level, we've left nice big planting pockets in places which we'll fill with soil and then plants, that'll be in the next video, but um, here's an overview of the pond including the beach which is basically just a collection of cobbles, again it's going to be planted so it will look better once it's planted. This is the bare bones of the dipping platform. So again, that's probably going to be in the next video. And this is the finished edging. Filled in the cracks between the stones with mortar and then pushed little cobbles in just to give it kind of like a river washed sort of a look. And it gives quite a nice effect. The liner will be cut back, but it'll be the very last thing that happens. So this is the beach area, we've got a couple of big cobbles just to break up the monotony of all the smaller ones. This is the side that we've just done this afternoon. Just kind of mirrors what's happening on the other side, broken up by the dipping platform. Pond can go up another two or three, maybe even four inches, but we've kept it low just so it doesn't interfere with any of the cement work. But it's definitely coming together now. Thanks for watching part four of how to build a wildlife pond. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, in part five, I'm going to be doing the dipping platform and also building a hibernaculum where amphibians will take refuge and also hide out the winter. Hello and welcome to part 5 of the large wildlife pond that I'm building at uh, Gosforth School. Today I'm going to be making the dipping platform and the hibernaculum. I've already got the bare bones of the, of the platform built, i.e. the front and the two sides. I'm going to cut a couple of supports now and then slowly build up the frame. This is the front of the platform, these are the two supports I'm putting in, so I'm looking down them, making sure that any bend goes up over, and then I'm going to screw them in with 100 mil screws, that's 4 inches if you're living in USA. This wood is all pressure treated pine. So it should last a hell of a long time outdoors and even with water lapping up it should still last at least 15-20 years. Um, it's very dry therefore it's very hard so before I put the screws in I'm pre-drilling holes just to make it a little bit easier.
makes the job a heck of a lot easier if you pre-drill some holes before you put the screws in. With the back of this platform kind of following the curve of the pond, it's a little bit more difficult to build. But basically what I'm going to do is fix these angled pieces in here, pre-drilling them and screwing them. So there'll be an angled piece here and at the back there. In the middle section, I'm going to put a straight with a little leg coming off and that'll all help to support the decking that's going on. Because of the shape of the base that I've got to work with, I'm uh, using 4x2s and 3x2s, a mixture of those, in order to make sure that this back edge stays level, I'm going to fasten a piece of 2x2 two two to the top, I'll pull everything up to the same level. That's it. Everything's brought up to the same level, so I know that at least this back is level. The front end should be level as well because it's got a piece of 4x2 running right along it, and it's a straight piece. Um, now all I've got to do is put the supports in. To support this, it's easiest to work from inside the pond, so I've got the waders on so that I don't get wet. Obviously in a warm country, it might be quite nice to take a dip, but in England, not so good. Um, I've chopped up various points around the outside so that this frame is more or less level, pretty much there. It's a little bit low here, so this is where I'm going to start. I'm going to drop a post in, mark it, cut it off, and then fix it with screws. Now if you remember from the previous videos, there's very large flat stones on the shelf under the water here to support these posts. That's pretty important that the posts actually rest on something really solid. You could put a concrete foundation in when the pond was dry. I prefer to use just big stones. You know it's not going to go anywhere, it's not going to contaminate the water and it gives a really solid base for the post. So all I do is sit that in pretty much level. raise the front of the platform slightly so that the level tells me that the front's level and then mark it and then I'll cut it off and fix it. that one in nice and solid. Now all I have to do is repeat the process for this one and also for the one that's going to be here. I don't like to have one in the middle on the front. I like to set that one back a bit so if the kids are arriving on they can actually get underneath this platform with their nets unhindered by posts along the front. That's the other two in-pond supports sorted out, screwed in, 
really structurally sound. Um, now all remains is to put the supports in the back. We made a nice bed of cement there a few days ago when we were doing the previous step, building up the sides. So that gives us something really nice and hard to work from. That's the support sorted outside the pond, resting on the cement or resting on stones, making the whole structure very solid. I basically went round checking that everything was level, then getting little bits of 2x2, two 3x2, two, 4x2, two, two, basically whatever off cuts I had, putting them in, marking them, cutting them off, and fixing them. Right, that's it for the frame. I did add a few smashed up bits of the sandstone underneath the supports, just as a bit of extra measure, belt and braces sort of approach. Basically the frame's not gonna go anywhere. So now it's time to put the decking on. I'm gonna allow about two inches or so either side of the frame so that the decking hangs over the frame and you shouldn't be able to see all these supports and everything. As I mentioned before, I'm allowing approximately two inches, 50 mil, on either side, just to help hide the frame. I'm fixing these deck boards down with 70 mil screws. That's about right to short of three inches. This is double-sided decking. Got a really thick, deep groove on one side lots of little thin grooves on the other side. I'm actually using this decking, thin grooves up over. The more kind of like a wavy effect as opposed to a cut. And I find this side allows you to brush the decking out a lot easier. Especially if there's gonna be dozens of kids with mucky shoes climbing around on top of here. It wants to be easy to clean. So allowing for a 50 mil overhang ensuring that the decking is flat against the front I'm going to fix them with the screws I tend to keep the screws in a little bit approximately an inch, inch and a quarter that ensures that I don't get any splitting of the boards I'm going to work my way along finish this top board put the next board on and I'm going to allow approximately a 5 mil gap between the boards working my way back until I'm finished. One thing that probably bears mentioning is the shape of the screws. You'll see there that the little spiral bits don't go all the way up to the head. It's, in other words it's a wasted screw. It's got a waste there. What this does when you have two pieces of wood that you want to screw together, because you have this blank bit here, when you screw the screw in, it actually pulls the two bits of wood together, making them really solid, and that's pretty important. That does away with the need for clamps and all that malarkey, or pressing them down with your hand. You basically just put the two, woods, two bits of wood loosely together, screw them together, and they stay really tightly screwed together. <laughs> about it for the deck. I've worked all the way back, shaped it at the back to kind of match the curve of the pond. And now I'm just going to put this front board on here just to finish the front of the deck off. That's it, just finishes the front off nicely so you can't see the supports. Before I build the hibernaculum, just 
just off to my left here. I'm going to um, put a few plants in around the place and fill in all the planting pockets with soil ready for the main planting. Really only three species going in today as well as a few heathers for the top of the hibernaculum but I'll cover that in a minute. So I'll get on and do that. Planted a few plants around the sides. Heather, soft rush, pendulous sedge. The only one I'm putting in the pond today is the brute lime. This is so easy to plant because I took it from my pond. Bare root, no pot to knock off. Basically, all you do is just plug the stems into a hole between the stones, plant a root and take away. That's it, simple as that. Now it'll create a lovely raft across the top of the water and be a really good habitat for invertebrates. The plants I'm putting around the edges here really need to be able to survive two extremes. They need to survive being very wet when the pond is really high and everything's waterlogged. And they also need to survive being very dry in the summer when the pond's really low, if it hasn't been topped up. Um, these planting pockets are going to get very, very dry. So heathers, sedge grasses and rushes are excellent plants for that. Really all a hibernaculum is, is just a secure habitat for amphibians and insects and so on. Um, with loads of cavities, loads of little hidey holes, organic matter and ideally some sort of vegetation on the top. First thing I'm going to put down is a bit of soil. Spread that out. And then a pallet. Next thing that's going to go on top of here is a roof of sorts to the cave, which will be just odd offcuts of liner or underlay. I'm also going to put a bit more soil in here as well. I'm going to chuck a little bit of rubble in there, smashed up bits of spare stone, then I'm going to put the soil in. Basically anything just to create a myriad of little caves and holes inside the inside the hibernaculum. Decided to use underlay, soil sticks to it quite well. All I'm going to do is burn a few holes in to allow the soil that I place on the top to go through and create entrance holes for anything to come from this level up to the next level that I'm going to build. done, I can add some soil. See how it's dropping through the holes, filling up the bottom level. I 
allowed about two inches here as an entrance. Now all I'm going to do is drop another pallet on top. This one's actually got a little bit more of a solid top, so it's probably more suited to being on the top level. Chuck that in there. The creatures will be able to climb into the high vernaculum, mess around in the bottom, come up into this next level if they want to. So basically I'm going to do the same with this level as I did with the last one. I'm going to chuck a bit of rubble, smashed up stone in here, and then I'm going to cover the whole lot with soil. Looking in there I can see that the holes haven't been covered up so anything wanting to get from the bottom layer to the top layer can do so quite easily. By building a hibernaculum this way with lots of smashed up stones and so on it's suitable not only for toads and frogs and newts and so on, but also for a lot of invertebrates like wood lice, uh, basically anything that creeps or crawls, beetles and so on, worms, they'll all end up in here and they'll all be food for the amphibians. Now all I'm going to do Put a few stones around the outside and cover the whole lot with soil. Now that I've got a quantity of soil on top and also around the edges, I'm going to add some of the heathers that I've got around the edges and then build more soil up behind them.
that's the basics of how to build a high binoculum. Basically you just want loads of habitat within a soil mound. Of course you can make it with logs, bricks, pavement slabs, anything really. But I find making it this way, it, there's a lot of dry areas in there so it tends not to attract slugs, which would probably be a good idea if you're making one in your garden. In the next video, I'm going to be planting this up and adding a few more stones around it just to help retain the soil because if we get a, a lot of rain this soil has a habit of just disappearing so I'll basically be creating this as a rockery and planting it up in part 6Okay, that's the hibernaculum done. Basically just dug out patches of soil, pushed stones in, planted between them with heathers. I've put the odd sedge grass in there as well, just to, just to break things up a little bit. 
but basically the whole mound has been covered by soil and rocks and plants. There's a couple of entrances at the front here. Whether you can see that, either side of this sandstone rock, there's entrances so things can get into this pile. No doubt when rain washes a bit of soil off there'll be more entrances around it, but uh, in the meantime it's basically a cave with a load of type of habitat inside. Now we're going to put a couple of lilies in the pond, but seeing as these are newly potted up, i.e. they've only been in the pots for about five minutes, if I just put these straight down in the bottom, the buoyancy of the compost is going to overcome the weight of the gravel. In other words, everything's going to go bloop, and it's going to make a hell of a mess. So what I'm going to do is just put these in to about six inches of water, allow the compost to soak in all the water and then drop them down to the bottom. That's it. I'm going to leave that for about 15 minutes whilst I pot the other one up. Then it should be safe to put it in. Whilst the lilies are taking in water before I put them in the depth of the pond, I'm going to make some bunches of oxygenators. This doesn't look like much, but it's a really, really nice plant. It's called starwort. And basically, all I'm going to do is take some lumps of lead, wrap them around the bottom. so that they make a nice big bunch. Chuck them in the pond. Probably is enough in this bag for five or six nice big bunches, which is about right for this size of pond. Right, the lilies have had about 10 minutes or so to soak up the water, so they should be ready to put in now. still quite buoyant so they're going to go back out again soak in a bit more water if I'd just left them the whole lot would have been on the top I think I'll put the lilies in last I'll cut the liner off next when I'm cutting back the underlay and liner I tend to use the scissors and I get the liner as close to the ground as I can I do the same with the underlay But because the underlay doesn't stretch and therefore snap back a little bit, there's always a little bit more underlay showing. So what I do with that, I just get the flame gun on, careful 
not to have it too long on, otherwise it will burn the liner. And because the underlay has a lower melting temperature, I just tidy up with a flame gun. That just reduces it a little bit. Liner's still fine. Underlay melted into the ground. You can, of course, forego using scissors on the underlay. Be very careful, you can just use a heat gun and literally just cut it off with a, with a flame. But be very, very careful not to touch the molten bits of plastic because they are very, very hot. And they stick to your fingers and it hurts a lot. See from this that by using the burning trick to remove the underlay makes a really clean tidy edge. All I have to do now is chuck a little bit of soil in there and you'd never know there was liner and underlay buried under it. That's the edging with a little bit of soil in. You can see how it just covers everything up, fills in the little holes. Grass will grow into that lot and it'll blend in quite nicely. That's it, pond job's finished. Before I go, I will briefly run you through the plants that I've put in and then give you a little bit of a tour. Most of the plants around the outside are picked to live in two extremes, either being very waterlogged or very dry, depending on the level of the pond. So we've got them ones there, are pendulous sedge, they get pretty big. That's green rush. It prefers being wet, but it can survive pretty dry conditions. Should be standing up, but I took it from somewhere very, very wet, where it was flopped. Um, this little fella just here is soft rush. And really, that pattern's repeated all the way around. Soft rush, pendulous sedge, soft rush, rush and sedge, rush. A lot of rushes and a lot of sedges. In this one, because it's a very wet hole, just here, there's an iris as well. This quite tall plant here is called purple loose strife. It forms a nice bush. It's a little bit floppy now because I only dug it up this morning. This is wood rush. It forms a nice dense mat, very good for spiders that live very in, in either very moist conditions or extremely dry conditions. More brook lime. There's quite a lot of that because that forms a lovely mat over the cobbles and also out into the pond. More sedges to bind all the soil together. A few ferns to give a little bit of shade for the hibernaculum. A lot of heathers on here in amongst the stones because I would want the hibernaculum to be pretty much just a mound of heathers. Heathers create a heck of a good environment for spiders and all, all sorts of other insects and hopefully that should attract the amphibians to the hibernaculum. The other side of the pond pretty much mirrors this one. Um, that's a heather put in there just randomly. There's another random heather over here just to break it up a little bit. More brook lime, lilies, Stuck into the sides of the wall, there's also quite a lot of um, bog bean. It's its worst time of the year, but generally, that's it there, the big long stalk going back to the wall. They normally have three lobed leaves, very big, thick, waxy leaves, and they get a, quite a nice, like, snowflakey sort of flower on, beginning of the year. This time of year, a lot of pond plants are knackered, and including that, it's, it's had its best. This big mass here is water mint. Same with that there. I've also plugged the lily into the deeper regions of that underwater refuge there. Put two big lilies in pots. Took a while to get those to sink. I had actually put big cobbles in to weigh them down because the lily combs were so buoyant. 
These are the bunches of oxygenators, which is starwort. They should form lovely kind of underwater green bushes. And this is water soldier. It grows about 18 inches across. Again, creates very good habitat for wildlife, especially dragonfly larvae. They seem to like being on there. And there's a big iris just here, big yellow iris. I'll put the Latin names for all of these in the description if anybody's interested. There's also a few very small marsh marigold. Again, it's the worst time of the year from them. So they're very small, almost like little seedlings all plugged in around the sides. But really, once the plants establish, the pond should look very nice. If I can, I'll come back in a week or two, once the plants have settled, and I'll get another video. Then everything won't look so kind of false. But um, at the minute it looks all right. There's the hibernaculum. Once all the plants get established on there, that'll be an awesome habitat for, for practically everything that lives in or around ponds. There's two entrances there. And if you remember how we built it, there's, it's just like a cave with masses and masses of tunnels. Uh, really good habitat in there. All that remains is for me to thank you for watching. Um, if you've watched parts one to six, you have my condolences. Hopefully it wasn't too painful for you. But um, if you've enjoyed it, you join me on my next project. Thanks for watching.